everybody and welcome to another lecture. Today we are going to be focusing on the phylum Cnidaria. Now notice I did say Cnidaria, not Cnidaria or Cnidaria. It is Cnidaria, so the C is silent in this case. So when we're talking about the phylum Cnidaria, it is pronounced with an N even though it is spelled with a C-N. So make sure that you guys make that distinction as we go along. Um, all right, well, let's get to it. All right, the phylum Cnidaria. Now, the phylum Cnidaria has some amazing organisms in it, and I'm going to give you the characteristics in just a second, because we do want to focus on taxonomy. Remember, I want to remind you guys that taxonomy is really, really important. So when you guys are studying this, remember, we're in the domain, Eukarya, we're in the kingdom, Animalia, and this is the phylum Cnidaria. So there are three classes that we're going to be focusing on in the phylum Cnidaria. The first is known as the hydrozoa, or the hydroids, and essentially this is going to have three orders inside of that. So we have the class and then the order. So yes, you do need to know these. Now, of course, most of the taxonomy I'm going to test you guys on is the higher taxonomy, things like phylum and class. Could I actually test you on some orders? Yes. Um, or is it going to be a lot of the orders? No. Is it going to be some orders? Yes. So make sure, especially if I, if I really like go into one of those orders and give you a lot of examples on that order, like when we're in the order Decapoda and like Arthropoda. Yeah, I absolutely want you guys to know that one. But if you don't stress on it in too great a detail, you probably don't need to know it, but it always could be like an extra credit question. So make sure that you guys are at least paying attention to that as we go along. Because yes, the orders are important, but obviously I'm not going to test you on every last little thing because um, there's a lot of taxonomy, but do you need to know it? Yes. Do you need to know spelling? Yes. I know. I know, but you guys do. All right. So the first class, again, is three different orders inside of it. We have the chondrophora. An example of this would be a by the wind sailor, and we're going to see all sorts of pictures, but that's the by the wind sailor right there. Um, if I give you some of these example organisms, you probably should know them, especially for like identification purposes. Like if I went over it, you probably need to know it. Um, if I spend time on it, you probably need to know it. If I assign it as homework, you probably need to know it, stuff like that. All right. The next one is the Siphonophoras, order Siphonophora. This is the Brax. Um, that's this guy right here. We have the hydrozoa, uh, sorry, hydroidea, which are going to be your hydroids. This would be this little guy right here. We're going to see this guy is an exa great example of budding, really like buds off and then kind of goes off on his own. Um, then next up is the class Siphozoa. These are going to be your true sea jellies. So any of the Siphozoas under the order Coronata is going to be your true sea jelly. So that would be this guy right here. If you think of an actual sea jelly like this, notice I'm not saying jellyfish because it's not a fish. It's a sea jelly. That would be under the um, class Cyph Cyphozoa order Coronata. Finally, we have the class Anthozoa. These are kind of like your modified jellies. And these are going to be your order Actinaria, which are your anemones, or your uh, order Scleractinia, Scleractinia uh, which are going to be your stony corals. Oops. Um, again, so you've got your anemones right here, and this is your stony corals. Remember, stony corals get mistaken for sponges a lot, so make sure you guys make that distinction. All right, let's talk about all the Cnidarian classification, uh, sorry, characteristics first. Usually I like to put this first. I don't know why in this slide I put them the other order, but I gave you the taxonomy first, and now we're going to be focusing on the actual um, defining char characteristics that makes this phylum this phylum. Now, the first one is kind of a big one because they are gelatinous. Now, notice that we didn't say that they don't have true tissues. They do have true tissues. They just have these, like, gelatinous tissues. Um, so remember, the only phylum without true tissues is going to be your periphera. Everybody else after this that we talk about has actual true tissues. But these guys don't have, like, muscles like we do, but they do have um, this, like, gelatinous cells. And they do have a nerve net inside, so they do, they have control. They do know what's going on. And what's really important about these guys is they're the first ones that could actually move. And we're going to see that in the video later on. But that's kind of a big one. We had our first animal, our sponges that we learned about in The Shape of Life. Now we have the first animal that can actually move. So the fact that my arm goes back and forth like this is all thanks to this little Nigerian, because he was actually the first one with these little motor functions, which is super cool. So first animal who could move, Nigerian. Um, let's see. We have uh, radial symmetry in this case. Remember, this is one of the groups that has that radial symmetry. Not a lot of groups have it, so if you have radial symmetry, Again, you're probably going to be in this um, in this Nigerian phylum. 
Now, if you looked at all those different organisms, they do have different types of radial symmetry. Sometimes they're a little bit modified, and that's what we're going to see in the video, how each one of them are slightly modified. But they are all still radial symmet uh, radially symmetrical. They do have a single orifice, a single body orifice, which means your mouth is also your anus. Um, yeah, so it is called a mouth anus or one single orifice. So what you eat is also what you release your excrement from. Um, thank goodness we don't have that. We have two separate orifices. But these guys are small and simple and don't really need to because they don't even have a complex digestive system. So they don't have blood. They don't have a brain. They don't have eyes. They don't have all the things that make us us. So to have a single mouth anus orifice, it's really not that big a deal for these guys. Um, their mouth is surrounded by tentacles, so these guys do have tentacles. More important for them, they have tentacles with stinging cells on them. These stinging cells are known as either cnidocytes, which are used for capturing prey, or pneumatocysts, which are used for stinging or stunning prey. So uh, you'll hear me say either cnidocytes or pneumatocysts, same kind of thing. They're basically used for the capturing and the stunning and the eating and the and pulling towards the mouth. Um, so that's how these guys are actively predators. So you might not think that that jellyfish is actually out there to get you, but if it could, it would. And some of these guys are really, really big, and we're going to talk about those, which is just fantastic. Now, they do come in two basic body forms. Remember, body forms is important, just like we learned about with the diatoms, the centric and penning. These guys have two, known as the medusa. So you can think of medusa with her long... I'm just going to get rid of these. Medusa with her long tentacles that kind of hang down like this. So again, this is the medusa form. Flip that upside down and you actually have the polyp form or the flower-like form. So again, they're just modified, either the bell form, this little medusa form, or the polyp form right here. Okay, so those are the two body forms. So I might ask you, like, if you look at the hydroids, again, there was always the polyps. If you look at, say, like the true jellies, those are always going to be the actual medusa forms. And some actually go back and forth between whether they're a larvae or an adult or back and forth. Um, and we're going to see that in just a second. Hang on. So... This is a typical, well, it's not even a typical jelly because it's actually what's known as a modified jelly. What you can see right here is this big float is also known as the bell. So the bell is typically the top part of the jelly. So if you think about the tentacles hanging down here, this top part would be known as the bell. Now in some of these, specifically the cyphozoas, they are kind of the modified jellies. So they're not the true, um, the true jellies, the coronatas for sure because they actually have this modification in their bell. Now in this case, this is a Portuguese man of war. They actually have this modified bell into an air sac or a float. So this is actually what's gonna allow them to sit on the surface of the water like this and then get pushed by the wind wherever they need to go. That's why if you're ever in the water with something like a Portuguese man of war or um, anything like that, they basically tell you like, if you see the bell, go far away because you don't know how long these tentacles actually go. And sometimes they go for 10, 12, 13, 15 feet. It's really actually long distances in the water, so it's really hard to tell, and therefore you could get stung even though you're nowhere near this actual bell part right here. Now, if you remember Dory, right? Dory's bouncing on the little jellyfish bells, right? Because that's not where the tentacles are. The stinging cells are those pneumatocysts, right? And the nidocytes. Those are all going to be down here. So this is what is the nematocyst or the nidocyte. This is what's going to be actually injecting you when you actually get stung. Now, you didn't think you probably get stung. You're like, oh, there's a chemical or something. Not in the Nidarian's case. In this case, they actually have like harpoons, like straight up harpoons. So this is basically a little nidocyte, which is again used for the capturing. And inside is an nematocyst. And the nematocyst essentially is this little barb on a cannon almost that when it gets triggered, it will actually launch or discharge from the nidocyte outwards and inject into you. That's what makes these stings so like painful is because you're, you're physically getting stabbed by this guy. Now, this is also what makes them really, really great uh, predators because again, wrapped in all these tentacles are these nematocysts and nidocytes, and these are going to allow them to actually capture pretty big prey, despite the fact that they have no brain, they have no eyes, they can't see you, they basically just kind of float around waiting for something to come near it, trigger, and then just launch it, which is just crazy. So these guys are really good at it. So in this picture, you can see right here, this guy has captured a fish, which is actually really true. These guys are really good, um, really good predators. So not only can they move, they can kill. <sighs> Scary. All right, let's talk about reproduction for a second because we have to talk about reproduction. 
Um, these guys do it in a couple different ways. They do a sexual form and an asexual form. So the sexual form is just like we've talked about. We've got the sperm, we've got the eggs, they get released, and you're going to have that actual fertilization of the zygote. Now, um, when they actually develop, at, quickly after they become the zygote or developing um, baby, uh, they basically turn into what's known as a planula larvae. Now, this planula larvae is a very specific type of body morphology that they have during this larval stage that helps them to survive. It also helps them to kind of like maneuver their way around a little bit. Um, once they settle on the bottom, this is actually where they're going to become most of the time stuck. If you're a stony coral, if you're a hydroid, you're going to pretty much be there. An anemone, although a couple anemones can move, which we're going to see, which is so cool. Um, but you're pretty much stuck there, and therefore you, sure, you want to make sure that your planula actually picks a pretty good spot for, before you settle, and then you're stuck there forever. Um, let's see. Once they go from that, again, planula larvae stage, they'll turn back into the medusa form or to the hydroform, depending on which you know, type of species you're actually talking about. Now, the asexual form is going to be some things like that hydras that we just talked about, right? You have your, your beautiful little hydra right here, and imagine you just grew a little one, and it just pops up and goes, Beep, and just buds off and goes away. That's the asexual form, genetically identical to the parents, but um, just little copies of yourself. All right, so let's see this right here. So we basically have, where do I want to start? Let's start with fertilization. So we have the male we have the female, they're reproduce, sorry, they're producing their gametes, their sperm and their eggs respectively. That sperm and their eggs are going to be released typically via broadcast spawning. That egg is gonna get fertilized as it starts to develop into an embryo. It will eventually turn into this planula larvae. The planula larvae is gonna swim around until it finds a nice little spot. Then it's going to settle and go through metamorphosis or just a change of body morphology. So then it's actually going to start to form the young colony or the young little hydroid. And then it's going to eventually start to become a mature colony where then can actually start to reproduce either these little medusa buds or just, you know, asexual budding, however it actually wants to go. So we have, um, again, you can imagine the tentacles on the outside. So imagine we just had the medusa form that we kind of flipped up and that's what you actually get this little polyp form. And then you're going to have this little reproductive polyp that's going to reproduce either buds or adult, that, um, um, actual reproductive adults in the Medusa form. So they go through this alternation of basically generations where they're going from one form to the other, depending on almost kind of like plants do it, not exactly the same, um, but closely. Uh, alternation of morphology for sure. You're definitely going from the polyp to the Medusa um, and back and forth. So works out really, really great for these guys. Taking a look at the inside, we actually have a couple different tissue layers, and again, this is really important because we haven't seen tissue layers so far, and we've only covered one phylum, but still, this is the first time we're actually seeing these tissue layers. So what you can see is we actually have an epidermis, you can think of like epi, like on the top, right, epidermis, dermis means skin. You have your mesoglea, which is the inside layer right here, your gastrodermis, essentially your gastric cavity or digestive system. Um, and again, the gastrovascular cavity is all kind of basically this, this center region right here, your digestive system area. You do have your mouth anus right here, or respectively right here. Again, there is only one opening, so what goes in also comes out the same opening. Thank goodness we don't have that. Uh, and always the mouth anus is going to be surrounded by these tentacles. This is again used for the stinging, the stunning of the prey, and they're going to be able to bring it in close towards their mouth and actually um, get that food particles and then digest it in their inner cavities right here and then release any waste products right out their mouth anus. I know, how many times are you gonna say the word mouth anus? At least one more. Mouth anus. All right, hopefully you guys at least find some of this entertaining. I try to make it as interesting as I can for you guys because I know when you're learning all of this different taxonomy, it can kind of be a lot and therefore I try to make it as fun as possible. So if I'm being silly up here saying mouth anus, then, you know, I'm just trying to get you guys to laugh and pay attention and learn fun words and body parts. Anyway, I won't say it again. All right, let's look at the class Hydrozoa. So we're going to be looking at the Chondrophora, the Siphonophora, and the Hydroidea. So we're looking at the By the Wind Sailor, that's this guy right here. Kind of modified just like the Portuguese Man of War. We actually have that modified bell into a sail, hence By the Wind Sailor. So this guy does the same thing. He only floats right on the surface of the water right here, and he's carried by the wind 
with his sail. So he, that's how he actually travels around. He actually is not really good at swimming. They have very, very short tentacles. So the Portuguese man of war has that gas bladder, very long tentacles. The by the wind sailor has a sail, right? No gas bladder, a sail and very, very short, tiny little tentacles. These guys are not going to ever sing you. Um, these guys are super cute. All right. Um, they're only found at the surface or there are free floating found at just the air surface interval is called neustonic. Uh, we're going to learn about that later on in the semester, but that's a fun word to learn. Neustonic. Uh, the order Siphonophora are going to be your Brax and your Portuguese man of wars. Remember, those Siphonophores are also the modified jellies. So they, like, don't really look like jellies. I mean, the Portuguese man of wars is the closest because it has that big old bell. Um, but the Brax don't look anything like it. The Brax are small. They're usually kind of more transparent. Um, and, and almost little, almost no tentacles you can actually see. They're basically just this kind of, like, almost like a little hat-looking thing. Um, I wish I could show you guys these in the lab, but... We're going to have to do our best this semester and just Google pictures of Brax. All right. Um, these guys can be colonial or free-floating. Colonial and free-floating, excuse me. Um, they also, like I said, with the siphonophores, the um, Portuguese man of excuse me, their tentacles are extremely long, especially compared to the by the wind sailors. Very, very short. Very, very long. There it is. Um, and they do, again, have this um, bell that is modified into a gas bladder. All right, and next up we have the order Hydroidea. These are going to be the hydroids. So these are pretty much polyp form only. So you can think of hydroids as like Hydroidea as they hydro. Excuse me, Hydroidea as just hydroids. So that that's always going to be that polyp form, and that's what we can see right here. Very very classic. These guys are solitary and they are benthic, meaning again, if you're going to be the little flower guy, you can't be swimming around because you don't swim very well, right? You don't have that modified belt. You have to be stationary, and that means you're going to be um, sedentary and benthic. Um, there are a couple freshwater species, actually. You can find some in freshwater ponds and lakes and stuff like that. Um, not nearly as numerous as the uh, hydroideas in the ocean, but again, they do have some freshwater representatives. So this is Valella Valella, or the By the Wind Sailor. So again, you can see very clearly right here, very short little tentacles, very defined sail, it is flat, again, just like a sail, so it's not that big round gas bladder like a Portuguese man of war. It is flat and, again, used to catch the wind, drag them along where they need to go because these tentacles are terrible at swimming. They can't get you anywhere. So that's actually how they move around. And you can see they're actually pretty small. They're all about that big, so nothing to worry about. If you see one of these, you don't have to worry about it stinging you. It's not going to. Its tentacles are extremely small. Now, yes, they do still have nematocysts and nidocytes, um, but they're really basically too small to pierce our, our tissue layers of our skin, so we wouldn't be able to feel it. Which is the same reason you can touch like an anemone and stuff when you go to the tide pools. If you actually touch one of the tentacles, it's not going to hurt you. It might stick to your finger a little bit and be like, oh, it's stuck. But it's not going to sting you because our skin is just way too thick and their nidocytes are just, um, sorry, nematocysts are just too small. They're not going to actually be able to pierce us. They're trying, but it doesn't work. <laughs> this is a Portuguese man of war, Physalia, Physalia. So these are easy scientific names to learn. This is Valella Valella, the uh, by the wind sailor, and then we have Physalia Physalia, the Portuguese man of war. It's way easier than you know Carcharodon Carcarius, like the great white shark. That's a bunch of different words, right? This is Valella Valella and Physalia Physalia. Actually, very easy. Um, we have our gas bladder right here. This is known as a pneumatophore. Now this is different than the pneumatocyst that we've seen and the P pneumatocysts, right? Pneumatocysts that we saw in the algae. So we have lots of different types of pneumat pneumatocysts and they're all spelled slightly different. And in this case, it's a pneumatophore. So make sure that you guys get the distinction straight between these vocab words because they're not that easy to learn and there's going to be so much more. All right, we have our tentacles hanging down. We have our gas ladder right here. Um, I'm not going to tell you guys that you need to know these three. I just want you to know the pneumatophore one. So the gonozoids, essentially, they're going to containing the gametes. Um, or gonads, and that's what they're going to be doing is basically holding and releasing those. We have the dactylozoids, like dactyla. Um, if you have dexterity in your fingers, that's known as, um, it's basically you're able to move or grasp, and that's kind of what these guys are doing. That's for that grasping and pulling in of the food and the prey that they, that they eat. And then we have the coiled stinging tentacles all the way down at the end, because that's what's supposed to sting you, and then we can slowly start bringing you towards the mouth anus. I said. And then you can actually get digested and then released. Um, so again, Physalia, Physalia, Portuguese man of war. 
This is going to be your common hydroid. So what you can see right here is don't worry about any of these vocab words. This is just for your reference in case you need to know it. But this is again kind of like the out, outline of body plan of what you can see right here. Now they do kind of look different. This almost looks like an anemone, but kind of like a weird anemone, but it's actually in a totally different um, order. So make sure you guys distinguish between the hydroids and the anemones because they are both the polyp form. All right, let's talk about the class Cyphozoa. So these are going to be the class Cyphozoa, the order Coronata. This is your true sea jellies. You could always tell a Coronata because of the moon shapes right here. So they're gonna have four, sorry, horseshoe shapes. They're gonna have four horseshoes that are kind of facing each other like you can see right here. That's a classic example that it is going to be a true sea jelly. Unlike say the Portuguese man of war or the by the wind sailor that we just looked at which are the modified sea jellies. Now these guys are only marine, hence the true sea jelly part. These guys are the gangsters, right? Um, they're pretty much found, they're like cockroaches. So think, you can think of like sea jellies as like cockroaches. They're found in every single ecosystem and they will survive when nobody else can. So if our entire planet dies, you'll probably still have jellyfish. I said it, sea jellies. Um, because these guys are just resilient. Um, unfortunately what's happening a lot of the times, like uh, if, say their numbers get a little bit out of control like in Japan what happens is they get all caught up in the, the fishing nets and then they pull up hundreds of thousands at the same time and what they do to kill them they're like oh we need to kill them they start hacking them up and then they dump them overboard what they don't realize is they just mixed up all the gonads all the the sperm and the eggs they basically just chopped up and made an like a smorgasbord of fertilized eggs which then they dump overboard that's actually causing a population boom and then again every single time they pull up those fishing nets they get in the way and they're like well, that's not what we we're trying to fish for kill 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 and they just have these huge reproductive blooms so Japanese fishermen are trying so hard to outfish everything in our ocean that they're kind of making things worse in many different ways that we're not we're just starting to understand um, and they are too, and, and we're kind of getting to a point where everybody realizes that like the earth is not infinite, infinitely full of resources, and therefore we should kind of kind of start to protect them. So hopefully we'll get there sooner rather than later. But anyway, let's get back to the Cyphozoas. Now we talked about the, the fact that jellies are really amazing predators despite the fact that they don't have brains, they don't have heads, they don't have eyes, they don't have a lot of the things that really most predators have. And, and that's how fascinating these guys are that they've been able to do so well in so many different environments for billions of years, well, millions of years at least, um, just solely being these simple, simple organisms with just no real hard parts, no skeletons. I mean, a lot of them can't even move that great. Yeah, they can kind of move, but they've actually mastered this whole movement and feeding and, and all these are really amazing behaviors um, despite the fact that they don't have a skeleton or any hard parts or brains or eyes or hands. I mean it's just it's really remarkable what these guys are capable of. Especially consider that they are 98% water and you're like wait 90 98% water. If you were to take one of these out dry it out in the sun what would be left? Essentially nothing. You would have dust and smud maybe a couple little yeah just in the wind. It's crazy. Um, but again, these guys are really good at the simple diffusion. So as in their very simple digestive system, essentially they're just diffusing these nutrients where they need to go um, all over their bodies and, and that works for them. They don't need a circulatory system because they don't have muscles and all this kind of stuff. So really cool what they've been able to do. There we go. Here's a couple of classic examples of the Coronata or the true sea jellies. Again, you see this very classic horseshoe shape that's very characteristic of the Coronatas. Now, not all of them can be seen. Again, if we have these darker bells, you actually won't be able to see them, especially when it comes to like this bad boy right here. No joke, this guy is like six feet in diameter. Six feet of jellyfish. Can you imagine coming up to one of these? I thought I had another picture where there's actually a diver behind it, but it's like the length of the diver and not even nearly as girthy as that. Oh my God, so this is huge. This is one of those deep sea jellies um, that are just, you know, still being discovered and, and so much is still being learned about all of them and it's just crazy. It's crazy. All right, getting to the class Anthozoa. So these are your stony corals and your sea anemones. So stony corals and sea anemones are very different from each other. 
but they are still in the same class of the Anthozoas. We have the order Actinaria. This is the um, anemones. These guys are benthic and sessile, meaning benthic sitting on the bottom and sessile stuck. Now there is one that we can actually swim around a little bit and you're like, anemones can't swim. We're gonna see a whole video and then you can tell me if they actually are. Now sometimes these guys, even though they're benthic, benthic and sessile, can be xenoepipelagic. Oh, there's that word again, or xenopelagic or xenoplanktonic. Remember, accidentally planktonic, right? Because they're going to be basically on connected to one of these floating buoys, a piece of trash, something like that. And therefore, all of a sudden, they're floating around in the plankton, despite the fact that they're supposed to be benthic. Um, these guys do not have a medusa stage, so polyp only, just like the hydroids. So the anemones and the hydroids, again, are going to be polyp only, no medusa. Uh, the order Scleractinia, these are your stony corals, always confused with sponges, but they're not. This is like your coral reef, guys. If you have a coral reef, it's going to be a stony coral. Um, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. We're going to learn all about the zoosanthellae, or the weirdy did, that live inside of them when we talked about the microbes lab. Um, but these guys are amazing. These guys also do not have a medusa stage, so polyp only. You're like, that doesn't look like a polyp. But if you were to actually take each individual one of these as its own polyp, it does have that radial symmetry, the tentacles surrounding the mouth, that polyp form. So again, even though as a whole it doesn't really look like that, if you actually break down into individual polyps, yes, it does have that radial symmetry that we talked about. So hence one of the Cnidarians. Um, let's see, these guys are benthic and should not shock you that they are hard. What? Yes, because they're made of calcium carbonate. Again, that hard structural material that is used as protection. So they do have this kind of skeleton outer um, hard coral structure and the polyps will actually poke out feed and then poke back in. Um, again, using that structure for protection. Now there are a couple different organisms that can eat them. In fact, when they do eat these polyps, essentially what they do is they scrape off the whole coral. <laughs> And they crunch it up and then they out the rock part and you know the hard part and then they eat the polyps parrot fish do that yeah so it's said that you know uh kind of oh we haven't talked about that yet oh we have so many fun things fun fact when you walk on the beach on the tropics a lot of that sand in fact probably most of that sand if not all that sand has probably passed through the backside of a parrot fish at some point yeah you're gonna think about that different when you walk barefoot on the sandy beach romantic like nope yeah, I'm going to ruin your guys' life when it comes to this stuff. It's going to blow your mind. But amazing, amazing fun facts. And really don't worry about it. It's clean. All right. So these guys, both the Actinarians and the Scleractinias, do have symbiotic relationships with that Zoosanthellae. Now, this one's the most notable one in the coral reefs. That's coral bleaching. That's why it's so bad. Where they're kicking out the Zoosanthellae, which are bleaching, which are killing the whole coral reefs. All bad, bad news. But... These guys do also have symbiotic relationships with the zoosanthellies, those little, um, zoosanthellies, the, the dinoflagellates that we talked about, right? They're super, you know, important primary producers that live inside the tissues that give them their color, that kind of stuff. Those are the zoosanthellies that we talked about. Here's just a couple of classic examples. Again, we have lots of different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, obviously, these guys here with the longer, thinner tentacles are probably going to be more deep water species because you don't want to live in a high wave area where your you know, tentacles are going back and forth, back and forth, and breaking off. So again, I want you guys to kind of look at the morphology of some of these organisms because their morphology will kind of allude to where they live. You know, this guy's short and stockier. Again, short and stockier, tucked between rocks, probably higher surf areas. Um, this guy is very long, thin tentacles, probably not high, high surge because, again, those can break off and that's how he feeds and therefore not a good thing. This guy's just so cute. It looks like little strawberries with a little cutie. Let's take a deep dive inside the actual tissues of an anemone. And what you can see right here is this is actually this limestone skeleton on the outside. We have our gastrovascular cavity, or just a little digestive cavity on the inside. Uh-oh, we can't see that. There we go. Okay, digestive cavity here, limestone skeleton on the outside. This is that polyp, that radial symmetry. This is what it resembles an anemone. Even though it doesn't exactly look like it, yes, it's still radial. Right, polyp comes up out of here, feeds off the tentacles here, and then if it needs to be tucked in, it will actually tuck in as use protection. These are the little tentacles right here with the stinging cells or the nematocysts and the nidocytes. The mouth is right here. You know what I was going to say, but I didn't say it. Um, and again, 
Basically, your zooxanthellae live on the inside layers of the tissue. This is helping them do photosynthesis, creating extra sugars, providing nutrients for this anemone. Um, or sorry, this is a coral. But anemone would be the same exact body form, just um, take away the limestone um, skeleton. And again, you have your sorry, nematocyst and the nematocytes on the outside of there, and therefore when triggered will actually give a little stinging. If you've ever been around the tropics and you know what fire coral is, you know that that stings like fire. So essentially it's just a stony coral with really strong nematocysts that hurt. And I have been stung by, by fire coral and it does hurt, but it's, you know, it's not going to kill you, but yeah, don't, just don't do it. Um, if you see them, they kind of look spiky and aggressive. Just don't, maybe just don't touch them. Actually, you really shouldn't touch any corals because really any kind of human influence on the corals, they're really sensitive and they can die super easily. So just stay away from them, especially if you're wearing sunscreens. Sunscreens will actually bathe these guys because you, you lather it on, you jump in the water, it comes right off of you and it actually copes them and it blocks the zooxanthellae from doing photosynthesis. And therefore, what's feeding the coral was the zooxanthellae, which are photosynthetic, which you just blocked with sunblock, and now they die. So it's actually a huge problem, and a lot of countries and, and places like Hawaii are actually banning um, non-reef friendly sunscreens. So at least we're working on it, we're getting better, we're realizing that we're doing a lot of stuff to mess up the planet, and, and therefore we are getting better, which is great. You know, it's, at this point, you know, we gotta start somewhere. All right, so more about the stony corals. These are all sorts of different stony corals right here. This is a brain coral. These guys actually get really, really big. I used to see a ton of these in, in the Keys when I was a kid, and now you see them, but they're, they're half dead or completely dead. It's really, really tragic. But remember that the co color of the corals is actually determined by the zooxanthellae species that lives inside of it. Corals essentially are just that white limestone skeleton with the little polyp that comes out, but really what gives that polyp that color is going to be the zooxanthellae species that lives there. And we have all different shapes and sizes, and some of them are round, and some of them are taller, and some of them are branched and flatter, and some of them just crawl along the bottom, well, crawl, spread out along the bottom. Um, so all different shapes and sizes, but again, any time of coral reef, it's going to be a stony coral, this Claractinia. This is again just kind of like another sideshow if we were actually looking at a cross section of said corals. This is the skeleton and these polyps actually live in a living layer on the outside right here and therefore when when you see the coral that's been bleached it's actually essentially all the polyps on the outside that have died and just left this limestone skeleton um so it's really sad but luckily this limestone skeleton is still used as a reef system it's remember it's rugosity it's complexity it's building 3d microhabitat so that these organisms can live there so that's why corals are so very important and those big coral reefs that you see are talking millions of years old. That coral has been growing for millions of years to drop that much limestone because this is a really slow growing organism. It takes a long time for this puppy to grow. And therefore that's obviously what's been doing such, you know, the reason that these corals haven't been able to come back as, as easily is because they are slow growing, long lived, and it takes a long time to build big things like the Great Barrier Reef. And therefore the faster we kill it, it's not gonna come back faster than that it's going to come back way slower if at all so these are things we need to think about for the next i don't know million or so years I impress you about coral reef bleaching although it's very important ocean acidification is causing the bleaching co2 incre increases are causing the bleaching temperatures it's all it's all bad stuff anyway i won't depress you we'll just keep moving on ah which brings us to our video guys this is another one of those shape of life videos this one is one of my favorites. You guys are gonna love it. Remember that it is mandatory, so make sure that make sure that you absolutely go watch this. I provided the link for you guys. I've also put the video up on the Canvas site for you guys, or you can just Google Shape of Life Nidarians um, on the move. Oh, they're just this this one's so cool. And also, 3D animations are amazing. They can show you so much better how these two uh, body forms are related and morphology wise. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on that. All right, I really hope you enjoyed it. And remember that video is mandatory, so make sure that you guys do actually watch it. Um, I could ask you questions for it on the test, and trust me, I'm going to, because they really are amazing resources, and they're only 14, 15 minutes long. In an entire week, you guys have 14 minutes to watch that video, as well as my videos. 
So again, a couple, these first couple phylums are a little bit shorter, but once we get to the larger phylums, it's going to be a long haul. So make sure you guys are paying attention to the schedule and you guys know what's going on and due dates, etc. Um, and if you guys have any questions, go ahead and just email me. Otherwise, you guys are doing a great job and congratulations on your second phylum in. Um, we got a lot more to go, so keep it up. Keep up the good work. Oh, wait, I'm not done yet. There's my terrible dad joke. I don't know if you guys can see it. You can probably see it. They're talking about box jellyfish something we didn't get a chance to talk about but box jellyfish are essentially one of the most dangerous organisms in the world they live in australian waters and tropical waters they're about that big but this is a different type of box jellyfish it's buck b-a-c-h like a buck like the because he's playing the piano i know terrible dad joke but i had to leave you with that so hopefully you guys got a small chuckle out of it at least um you guys can see the picture video better in the there it is you can see that better in the uh, actual PowerPoint. So make sure to study long, make sure to study for your exam, and I will see you guys soon. Take care and have a wonderful week.